Um, back in 2010, there was a, a nice paper um, that looked at 61 sequenced E. coli genomes. And, the, and you know, back seven years ago, there, there wasn't as many as there are now. Now there's, you know, with the AMD project, thousands. Uh, but they looked at 61 that were in the publicly available database and uh, wanted to do some comparative analysis. And so one of the questions, usually when I, when I give this talk, it's in front of a live audience, and I'll ask everyone, how big is an E. coli genome? And I'll get answers of, you know, 100,000, a million, et cetera. Um, but the genome size uh, of E. coli, different strains, can range from 4.56 to about 5.7 million bases. And that's a pretty wide range. Um, and then my next question, everyone, is, is how big is 5 million bases? Does anyone have a point of reference uh, for, for how big that actually is? And this is where I draw on some uh, popular culture and talk about the Harry Potter story. So I'll usually ask how many people have read the Harry Potter story. It's usually about three quarters of the audience, so people are really familiar with it. And you know, this is a long story. It's, it's got some pretty big books in the later series. And um, if you look on Google and you look at word counts, you could find out that there's 1,084,440 words in all seven books. So if you take the first word from the first page of the first book to the last word, the last page of the last book, you have 1,084,000 words. Google will also tell you that the average uh, word size of an English novel word is about five letters. So if you take um, that number, multiply it by the number of words, you have approximately 5,422,000 letters total in the entire Harry Potter story box set. Um, given that the E. coli genome ranges from 4.5 to about 5.7, then you know that a single E. coli genome equals about one box set of information. So if you were actually to manually sit down and try to go through the genome and read it, it would take you as long as you know reading the entire box set of, of uh, the Harry Potter story. And for reference, um, you know, there's a lot of genomes that can be a lot smaller or larger than E. coli. A lot of bacterial symbionts, especially in insects, can have genome sizes around 500,000 uh, uh, base pair, which is kind of closer to, you know, the first three books of the novel that are kind of thin. And then, um, you know, other uh, organisms like Rickettsia can have a million. And then you have a lot of cellulose degrading, wood degrading organisms that can range up to 13 to 14 million bases, which actually exceeds or, uh, the genome size of Saccharomyces cerevisiae and gets pretty close to some primitive nematodes. So the, the diversity of genome size in bacteria is actually quite large. And for reference, a single human genome is about a thousand box sets of information. So the human genome has about three billion uh, nucleotides in it. Uh, if you're a dip, well, all of us are diploids, so it's, that brings you to six billion, so it's about a thousand box sets of information. So a technique that most people are, are pretty familiar with in analyzing bacterial genomes and trying to do molecular typing of isolates is post field gel electrophoresis. Now, you know, we, I just mentioned how the uh, Harry Potter story contains five million uh, letters, and then here you've got 20 bands on a gel, and so you're looking at the difference in how much information you're getting, and, and you want to know what do these bands really mean when you look at a PFGE gel. So in a, in a simplified example here, um, what I've done is show, say, five circular E. coli genomes here of about a five million bases, and show you what happens when you cut that genome in one site versus two sites versus three and four, what that would look like on a PFGE gel. So in the first example, you have about 5 million uh, bases. You have one site, you're going to get a band about 5 million bases, a single band in a gel. And by the way, technically on PFG gels, we don't see bands, you know, bigger than say six or 800,000 or smaller than 30 or 40,000. But there's just an example to, to help out understand the process. If you took the same genome and had two sites of where you broke the genome, you would get two bands and they'd be appropriately sized here. You had three sites, you'd get three bands, approximately, you know, roughly these sizes. Um, two sites, uh, not symmetrical, you'd get about two bands, about 2.5 million bases, slightly off. Uh, 
And if you had four sites, you know, you'd have four bands here. And I showed an example where you'd have a much a large band and then three little bands down here. And these restrictions and sites we talk about are actually, you could think of as a word. Um, down here, I believe this is uh, Expo One, and it's a word that you could find in the genome if you're reading it. And this is where the enzyme will cut. What's important about this is then we can draw an analogy uh, once again to the Harry Potter story, where a specific word in the story can equal a restriction enzyme site. So Voldemort, he who shall not be named, is actually named 31 times in Sorcerer's Stone, 20 times in Chamber of Secret, and 37 times in The Prisoner of Azkaban. So you consider these uh, first three books, you know, to be bacterial symbiotes, say they're smaller organisms we're trying to type with an enzyme that cuts at Voldemort, and you can see the number of bands that you'd get, and these bands would be a very distinctive size based on where the word Voldemort is within the novel. So a lot of times why we'll use more than one enzyme with PFGE is not only does word frequencies determine uh, the banding pattern, but different words will re represent different enzymes and different banding patterns. So if we look at these three novels again and say there are three small organisms, if we use an enzyme for a broomstick or spell or wand or wizard, you can see the different numbers of bands that you would get for each of these enzymes. And then you'll even get some that'll have the same number of bands but they'll probably be in different positions. And what's really interesting to think about here is so when you're looking at PFGE, you know, what is this, this really telling you? Yeah, it can help you classify uh, your organisms in a group a lot of the time based on the specific banding pattern. But, you know, in, in the case of an enzyme that's uh, respected for Voldemort, you only know that Voldemort is mentioned 31 times in specific positions in the novel. You know nothing else about the story. And, you know, if you have typos in the novel, think how many typos you would have to accumulate before one of those typos would hit one of the 31 uh, instances of Voldemort and made it Voldemort or something like that, or Voldemort. Um, so a lot of change can happen within a genome, and it's not going to be detected by PFGE. And then a very small change, a single change, can happen and just change that one word and change a banding pattern, and it can mean next to nothing at all. So once again, one way of thinking about SNPs, as we'll talk about that in a little bit of detail, is a SNP is really a typo, say in a novel, um, and it's a typo in a genome, and we'll use that for comparison with whole genome sequencing. So when you're, when you're thinking about what does PFG really tell you when you look at the different types of isolate identification techniques, um, these range from serotyping to PFG, 16S, MLST, whole genome MLST, whole genome SNP, HQ SNP. You've seen a lot of these abbreviations. Um, but I've arranged them here in the order of increasing resolution and increasing information. So, you know, serotyping, a lot of times you're only looking at protein expression on the cell surface. When you're doing PFGE that we just talked about, even though you're using total genomic uh, DNA, you're only looking at fragments and you're only looking at a very small proportion. So if these word sizes are only six nucleotides in length and you've got 20 fragments, you're only looking at 120 letters out of 5 million characters. So you're not getting a lot of biologically relevant information. You can move on to 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing. Uh, that helps you a little bit more. You can use up to 1,500 nucleotides there and help classify your organisms by the genus and species. Uh, but once again, you're looking at a very small region. When a lot of people talk about MLST, they're talking about a more traditional MLST where, you know, if you think with the ribosomal gene, one gene's good, well, seven genes will be better. So it's multi-locus sequence typing. They move to seven genes, which they expect to be present in all the organisms they want to examine in an analysis. We also hear about whole genome MLST, where whole genome MLST says, well, if seven genes is good for MLST, then thousands of genes for whole genome MLST will be better. And whole genome MLST is getting a lot of traction right now uh, because you can cover that thousands of genes, but you could also cover something called the pan genome, which we'll discuss later. And then you have what you call the, the ultimate resolution because whole genome MLST is only looking at, uh, you know, known genes, protein coding genes, RNA coding genes, a whole genome SNP or high quality SNP is looking at the entire genome and looking for typos throughout the entire genome. And as you can see on the left, 
I designate whether something's protein, whether it's DNA-based, sequencing-based, or whole genome sequencing-based. So how does whole genome sequencing work? So go back to having some Harry Potter box sets, and what your laboratorians actually do is they'll take those 40 box sets and they'll throw in a wood chipper, essentially, you know, this aggressive feed, massive chipping capacity, and literally shred these books into millions of pieces. A, you know, my seek run will read approximately 60 million of these pieces of uh, book fragments that come out. And then, much like uh, political activists in Ukraine trying to piece together shredded documents from Viktor Yanukovych's private palace and try to incriminate him, uh, they try to piece back together the entire Harry Potter series. And what this looks like in the lab is we're going to take a culture of microorganisms. Um, you know, for PulseNet, that'll be Salmonella, Listeria, Campy, E. coli. And then using sophisticated enzyme kits, uh, we're going to break these DNA fragments, these genomic DNA from these isolates, uh, into small pieces, into basically sentence sized fragments. And then we're going to load these onto our MySeq Illumina instrument, and we're going to get out approximately 60 million reads of about 250 characters long. Um, there's no way you could read this manually. There's no way you could do anything with this, um, you know, in Excel, uh, you know, in Word or anything like that. So you take advantage of computing resources. Now, years ago, when computers weren't as fast, yeah, you need some type of cluster. With human genome sequences, when working with a lot of them, you're going to want a little higher um, capacity computational power, but when it comes to um, the whole genome sequence of bacteria, given that they're a lot smaller, a lot of this stuff can be done on a, a decent, decently powered desktop in the lab. It'll take a little bit of time, but it can be done. And you want to piece together the genome sequence uh, of the organism. And right now, when we do these MySeq runs, oops, not dead, we perform these MySeq runs, um, depending on the chemistry, depending upon the instrument, there's a couple different instruments other than MySeq. We'll be sequencing 16 to maybe close to 40, or some of the newer instruments, 80 isolates on a single run. So it's pretty neat that something that, you know, 20, 30 years ago would have been somebody's uh, thesis work for a PhD and taken years, we do in a couple days and do, you know, 30 to 100 times over. So how is whole genome sequence used for outbreak investigations? How does this increased resolution help you? Um, so one organism that I hear a lot about, and this is the Salmonella enterica, Cervar enteritidis. And even though you're all muted, I know there's a lot of epidemiologists on it, and I, I can almost hear the groans uh, from people thinking about this organism and the problems that it causes because of its relatively stable genome and, and not a lot of diversity. And if you use techniques like PFGE, and you look at these, my mouse uh, keeps jumping the head and back, but, so if you look at these PFG patterns, I just grabbed four patterns, I mean, uh, four isolates from these two different patterns over the past four years in Colorado. And you can see year after year from uh, 2013 to 14, 15, 16, we're gonna see the same exact pattern over and over again. Uh, once again, over the years, this other pattern, and there's a paper I'm going to talk about in a second that came out of the Minnesota Public Health Lab with bioinformatics from Wadsworth, where they're talking about, at least in Minnesota, uh, this uh, JEGX01004, this PFG pattern right now accounts for about 53% of the enteritidis uh, serotypes in Minnesota. And given that about 36% of all salmonella outbreaks in the U.S., or Salmonella and uh, Enterica cervar and Teridotis, uh, this is quite a problem where you really don't have the molecular tools to have the um, help you in your epidemiological investigations. And this is really also the most frequently reported serotype worldwide for Salmonella. So I don't expect you to see all the details on this slide. I'm gonna dive into it in the next two slides in greater detail, but once again, this is a paper out of Minnesota and Wadsworth, where they were looking at Salmonella enterica, Cervar enteritidis, with whole genome sequencing. And they were using a high quality SNP analysis, so they weren't using 
whole genome MLST. And, and this type of analysis requires a lot more work. It's difficult to do in real time. Um, so they did a retrospective study. They went back and looked at uh, 55 different samples from clinical isolates and one sample from an environmental isolate between, I think, 2010 and 2014 and said, you know, if we had whole genome sequencing working for us when we were examining these outbreaks, um, how would it have changed our analysis? How would it have changed our outbreak characterization? And they had a lot of epidemiological data to help them with this retrospective study. But on the big picture, what you could see is a phylogenetic tree here with seven different outbreaks um, classified in here from 2003, 2000, 2001, 2001, 14, 14, 11. And all these outbreaks right here are in the same PFG pattern. So when they got these outbreak samples, whether it be a clinical isolate or environmental isolate, um, they're all coming to back with the same PFG pattern. So the PFG was really uh, not that significant. If they, say, used another enzyme, they might have been able to get some better resolution and categorize these outbreaks. Uh, but once again, uh, doing additional PFG enzymes and PFG experiments is going to cost more time and money, and time is really of the essence during a lot of these outbreak investigations. So there's a, there's a couple really neat um, stories here in that phylogenetic tree if you um, blow up the phylogenetic tree and look at it. One of the things that they found out is the whole genome sequencing does classify these organisms within their outbreak definitions. Uh, so they had these well-defined epidemiological outbreaks, uh, and the whole genome sequencing confirmed that. And you can go in, and, and when you see an, an outbreak clade here, so you have outbreak one and outbreak two, and they have seven of them, they found out that when they did the whole genome sequencing, they looked for typos in the salmonella genome versus a reference sequence, that all these outbreaks, um, the genomes in there are only different from, differed from zero to three SNPs. So it's like an entire box set of Harry Potter having only three typos in it. And that was defining an outbreak. Whereas if you look between two outbreaks, so you look between outbreak one and outbreak two, on average, you were gonna see about 40 typos. So you're getting this very clear delineation between what is defined as an outbreak cluster and what could be defined as a separate outbreak cluster. Not only that, if you looked at some sporadic cases, say, this example out here, on average you were seeing about 65 SNPs difference, 65 typos. What I really like about this paper though, was they did three things. Not only did they look at the um, clinical isolates from well-defined outbreaks, but they also brought in suspected um, isolates. They brought in, um, sporadic cases, and then in this instance, with these bees here, they brought in samples from the same patient over five weeks. So they show that in this outbreak, if they went back to this patient multiple times and got different isolates, that each time they did it, they only varied in that five-week period um, by two SNPs, showing that during an outbreak, uh, this specific organism is incredibly stable these isolates over time will still fall within the same outbreak. Moreover, when they had these suspect isolates with A here and, and A up top, which were suspect because they were during the same time period that the same PFG pattern, but they had no common exposures, that you can clearly see that the bottom one A is, you know, when I had to blow this up, it's completely in another area on the phylogenetic tree, completely unrelated to this outbreak up here, number one. But another suspected outbreak um, clearly fell within this clade, and without epidemiological evidence, I'd be cre pretty confident saying, based on the whole genome sequencing data, that this is indeed one of those um, outbreak samples. In another part of the tree, they're looking at another three different outbreaks um, from 2014 and 2011. And once again, you can see these uh, clear outbreak clades based on whole genome sequencing. They're still varying by zero to three SNPs, zero to three typos. And what's really nice in, in this part of the tree, they had some additional suspect out isolates. Um, and these two, the ones that are marked by C, you know, fall without the outbreak, without, uh, fall outside the outbreak um, 
clades. So these could be ruled out as suspected isolates for the outbreak. Um, but an area that I'm very interested in, they included a sample in, and this is an environmental isolate. So the majority of these, you know, salmonella uh, enteritis are going to be from, you know, egg and poultry products. And so this particular outbreak, they suspected that there was from a certain egg farm. So they went to the egg farm, they took a swab, they got an isolate, and when they did the whole genome sequencing, the isolate fell perfectly within the outbreak cluster here uh, with the clinical specimens. And this is an area that I'm very interested in, that I think you're going to see a lot of work in, um, but it's an area where you could get more active in your environmental surveillance and then start building up a, a database of environmental isolates such that when your first clinical isolates come in, you could use whole genome sequencing to compare it, compare it to environmental isolates. And you might even be able to start defining um, you know, a foodborne illness from patient one if you have a close enough hit to something that was picked up in environmental surveillance. So I, I think that's gonna be one really exciting area going forward with a lot of this work. Going back to the E. coli paper, they had a really nice quote here as to, you know, why we want to use whole genome sequencing and, and also in, in going beyond outbreaks. So, you know, showing you that phylogenetic tree, it works really, really well for classifying outbreak clusters. You know, you can go in and you can look at the uh, typos between the two different novels, you know, using a computer to compare the text. Um, we've got these typos in these areas they're related or not related, but there's so much more to do with whole genome sequencing. And that's because, you know, looking at typos is one thing, but reading the story is another thing. Um, and they had this nice quote where, you know, comparison of these 61 genomes, genome sequences revealed that neither 16S nor gene fragments for MLST provided biologically meaningful information on the relatedness of the sequence, uh, sequenced isolates. And the best way to analyze this is by taking into account all the genomic information content rather than looking at one or a few individual genes. So going back to the range of sizes for E. coli and this 4.5, 5.6, you know, this is over a million basis difference. And if you look at the gene density in something like E. coli, a million bases equals about a thousand genes. So you get a two different E. coli species, two different strains, that could have over a thousand genes difference between them when you're looking at the larger versus the smaller E. coli. And this is quite significant. And this starts to introduce us into a topic, and this is about as complicated as I think I'll get in this presentation, but the, the difference between a core genome and a pan genome. Because if you've heard about whole genome MLST, some of you might have heard about a core genome MLST, pan genome MLST, you know, what is a core genome? What is a pan genome? So the authors in this paper, what they did was they said, okay, we are going to put along the, the x-axis our E. coli isolates, our genomes. And on the y-axis, we're going to put the number of unique gene families that we find. And we're going to also plot on the, the red line here those isolates that are shared between the current one and all the previous ones. But then also in blue, we're gonna put a line as to what is the total number of genes we're finding in coli as we find new unique genes in each, each genome and what's that cumulative pan genome. So the red line is the core genome, the blue line is the pan genome. So you add your first isolate, you've got you know 4,400 genes, all 4,400 because you've only had one isolate are the core genome and all 44 are the pan genome. But if you add in another isolate, well, there's a few genes down here that are unique, so your pan genome goes up. But there's a few genes that aren't shared between these two organisms, so your core genome goes down. So what happens is as you add 60 isolates to this or more, your core genome, those genes which are shared between every single one of the genomes, is gradually going to go down. And in this case, it goes down to about 15, or 1,000 nucleotides when you add in some of the Shigellas. It stays at around 1,000 gene families when you add in the Shigellas, about 1,500 when you're just sticking with E. coli. But your pan genome with your gene families is rapidly increasing as you're adding in all these new organisms, and your pan genome starts increasing up to 15,000 or more genes. And this was back in 2010, so now, 
you know, your pan genome is going to be even larger. And I think there's some reports of it being closer to say maybe 100,000 genes um, in the pan genome. And what's really interesting about this is, yeah, your core genome down here is really defining what it means to be E. coli. But this difference between your core genome and your pan genome are really defining your unique biological characteristics. The thing that's making, uh, you know, an 0157 E. coli is very pathogenic, very different from an E. coli BL21 over here. That's just a common E. coli used in every molecular biology lab for cloning. So it's this really unique biological uh, characteristics that are found between the core genome and the pan genome, um, which give you that much more biologically relevant information. Now, when you're doing high quality SNP analysis, you're just looking for typos, even though you have really, really good resolution for differentiating those, unless you went in and started really annotating the genomes, it's hard to quickly get that meaningful biological information. But if you use something like whole genome SNP analysis, I'm mean, not whole genome SNP, a whole genome MLST for E. coli, you're very quickly going to get these profiles from an organism in a very short period of time. Now, I stole this data from Heather Carlton. She uh, recently gave a, a slide um, almost exactly like this at the Re regional PulseNet meeting. But it shows you that in the tools that they're building at the CDC now, and incorporating into bionumerics, and coming soon to a public health lab near you, um, in about 72 hours from isolate um, in hand, you know, you're going to be able to you know, sequence it in 48 hours and then do bioinformatics in, you know, 12 to 24 hours, and you're going to know by using whole genome MLST that it's E. coli, that you have a serotype uh, um, identified. You have a pathotype identified. You have a virulence profile identified by the genes that are present. You have a sequence type from your 7-gene MLST experiment. You have your antimicrobial resistance genes identified. And they spend quite a lot of time, and I don't have time today to talk about it, but you can get your whole genome MLST code. So it's kind of like an address within a um, mega uh, phylogenetic tree as to where that organism lives. And you could start to use maybe even that whole genome MLST code to compare how similar two organisms are. And all this is made possible because of uh, different groups and organizations working on databases like Serotype Finder, Virulence Finder, Res Finder, and incorporating those into whole genome MLST schemes that can be brought into bionumerics to do very rapid analysis. And for those of you that aren't Star Trek fans and might not know what this is down on the right, this is the uh, tricorder that you always see from the, the 60s as Star Trek. And you know the way they could just take a little wand and wave it over somebody and know exactly what's wrong. You know, when you think about, you know, decades ago where it was taken years to get an E. coli genome, and now we can get dozens of E. coli genomes in a, in a couple of days, I don't think it's unreasonable to think that maybe in another 20, 30 years, we have something very similar to a tricorder where you take a little spot of blood from somebody or a little bit of an isolate, and instead of taking 72 hours, maybe you take um, 72 minutes or 7.2 minutes to actually get that identification. So I, I think a lot of exciting things are going to happen with this technology um, as we learn about it, as we uh, a, uh, accumulate uh, more data. And, you know, as this whole sequencing revolution has taught us that what can make biology really exciting is advances in technology outside of biology, like in microfluidics, digital cameras, um, can cause exponential growth in uh, information collection and understanding uh, like the sequencers have for microbiology. So in a, a summary of, of you know, the, the potential whole genome set, uh, sequencing applications that I think of uh, right now, um, you know, the first one obviously is outbreak investigations. You know, you could separate sporadic versus outbreak and cluster those outbreaks and in, in basically real time now. I think um, PFG might beat you by about a day now, but given the information that we're soon gonna have with whole genome sequencing, it might be worth that extra day to have all that uh, pathotype and serotype and virulence information by whole genome sequencing. Um, it's good for microbial source tracking. You get those environmental samples, you can figure out which source 
was actually the cause of a uh, foodborne outbreak. Uh, microbial surveillance, you know, uh, you could uh, surveil food prep areas, so not only the food, but things that could be in the preparation areas, uh, you know, from the environment, from animals, from the soil, you know, you can go out and, and, and just start sampling fecal matter and in fields that people will hike through and, you know, what's in there, what could they be carrying home in the bottom of their shoes and then spreading around their living rooms for their, you know, six month old to crawl around. Um, and then also I think antibiotic resistance monitoring is going to be revolutionized here. So, you know, you're never going to get away from having to do the actual uh, phenotypic, uh, you know, AST type of experiments. Uh, but for those instances where genotype does predict phenotype, where you know the gene that is responsible for an antibiotic resistance phenotype, whole genome sequencing is going to be able to give you a very quick answer and probably a cheaper answer than having to do all those tests in the lab. And then also for the antibiotic resistance monitoring, depending on how you're doing your whole genome sequencing, you could really get into that, um, you know, mobile versus integrated uh, antibiotic resistance. So when I hear about antibiotic resistance and integrated into a genome, I'm not too worried about it. But when I hear about these mobile elements that could jump, you know, from organism to organism and potentially from species to species that have antibiotic resistance on them, those are things that you really have to start uh, taking notice of, which, which people have. And then with the virulence gene monitoring, you know, that was just shown in the, in the previous slide that, you know, you could start taking that into consideration in, in your outbreak investigations. So not only will you know there's an outbreak, but, you know, what, what is the impact on human health going to be based on the uh, pathotype, uh, antibiotic resistance type of that organism? And I say, what else? Because, I, I you know, as we start diving into this, these genomes and learning more about them, I think we're going to uh, learn very quickly about additional applications of this um, of the information we're getting. So at this point would probably be a good time for closing. I put up one of my favorite, um, you know, geeky science comics about a bacterium traveling through the hospital kitchens and being approached by a member of the antibiotic resistance. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very appropriate to today on, on how things are actually happening. And whole genome sequencing is going to teach us when these things are happening, how often they're happening. Um, so it's, it's going to be a very exciting time. So with that, um, I'm done with my part, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Joel. So if anyone has any questions, there are a couple of different ways to do this. So you can type it in the question and answer box, and we will get those. You can also raise your hand, and we can make your presenter so you can ask a question live, if that's what you want to do. Um, the first question was not a question for you, but will the slides be shared? So yes, we will record. The webinar has been recorded, and the whole recorded webinar will be shared. Um, to get us started by people putting in question, Joel, one question. So you showed that you see differences even with isolates obtained from the same patient. How likely are these true differences, or when you sequence 3 million, do you expect for some of these differences to be actual errors in the sequencing? Um, right now, I would expect them to be real differences. And the reason for that is with the Illumina instruments, um, you get quite a bit of uh, sequencing um, coverage uh, for your different areas of the genome. So we have thresholds for the different organisms. And Listeria, I think it's like 20x, E. coli is up around 40x, but routinely we're getting 60 to 100 fold x. And the algorithms that are used to actually identify a typo, a SNP, are pretty stringent. They'll say, you know, in order for us to say there is an actual difference in the genome of this organism, you know, it has to be present in, you know, you have to have at least 20-fold coverage of that genome. So there has to be at least 20 reads that covered that area. The um, change, the typo, has to be present in at least 95% of those reads there. And, um, you know, once you have that type of coverage, and you have that type of statistical conference, uh, confidence, you know, you're, you're really gonna believe that that's a real uh, change in the genome of that organism and not a, a sequencing error. Okay. And once again, those type, those um, parameters that I mentioned will have to be determined not only for, uh, you know, different organisms like E. coli versus salmonella versus listeria, but will also be de determined for different serotypes and strains within an organism. 
So there's a lot of work there to be done, and it, which is why you know the AD, AMD program is, has such an emphasis on trying to get these larger numbers of uh, um, isolate sequenced, is so they can learn what those parameters are uh, for those uh, to in order to have the, that confidence for the different organisms. Okay, thank you. So we have a number of questions come in, so I'm gonna to try to sort of moderate them and bring up some, some of the common themes. So one of them was, um, for pathogens like TB, to what degree is epi, for example, to establish a relationship between cases needed to interpret WGS? Do you need strong epi data to interpret the WGS results? And I think that's something that's probably in everyone's mind. So if you wanna quickly maybe comment on the importance of epi in conjunction with WGS? So I, I've been asked this a lot. And my opinion is the epidemiological data becomes even more important. And the reason why I say that is, you know, every organism is gonna be different. Every organism is gonna have a different level of genetic stability and it's gonna change over time. And what you really are gonna want when you start moving into some of these uh, organisms that you might not have a lot of data for, is you're gonna really want very well-defined epidemiological outbreaks where the epidemiological data is, what I think, for lack of a better term, rock solid. You know, you know that these people all got at the same time, had the same exposure, and have the same pathogen. And then what you could do when you do the whole genome sequencing on that um, outbreak cluster, that's going to teach you what the threshold should be for whole genome sequencing. So, you know, with the Enereditus here, um, a lot of their data kind of taught them that, you know, an outbreak is going to be within zero to three cents. And that, you know, the differences between outbreaks are going to be, you know, probably 40 SNPs or more on average 40 SNPs. But you might find something like in TB that outbreaks um, are defined by, say, 20 or 30 SNPs. And that, you know, between clusters, it might be 100 SNPs. So I think that when it, especially when it comes to new organisms, the epidemiological data is going to be really, really critical in establishing those thresholds, those confidence levels for the whole genome sequencing. Once you have them established, you know, that whole genome sequencing will be less critical to the process. But in the beginning, it's, it's going to be essential. We right. probably won't be able to do it without it. Okay. Thanks, Joel. So just so I think whole genome... Epi is very, very important in the day of whole genome sequencing. I think at two stages, number one, to establish what is similar enough, but then even once you have those data, there's still mechanisms to have similar identical organisms, close to identical organisms in different places. So, and I think we will cover more on the importance of epidemiology and interpretation of whole genome sequence data and some of the additional webinars. I'm going to combine a few questions. So one of them was to speak to the cost per genome analysis, but also the time scale required to prep samples prior to sequencing. Mm -hmm. I think those two go together because obviously time equals money. Mm -hmm. um, I did have a slide that I didn't include that I would have stolen from Heather Carlton also. Uh, but when they broke down the cost uh, per isolate, when you looked at, say, um, you know, virulence typing, serotyping, uh, PFGE, uh, res um, antibiotic resistance testing, that the cost of all those tests uh, on an isolate versus just doing whole genome sequencing, that the whole genome sequencing was maybe two thirds the cost using a MySeq. If you, if you were gonna do all those tests on it, or one of the biggest costs was the, the serotyping. As for the time, you know, it's, it's, getting, it's getting faster. So if you have an isolate in hand, um, say Monday morning you have an isolate in hand, you could, if you pushed it um, with sequencing, you could get it on a sequencer by that evening. Most likely it would be the next day. Um, but if, say, if it's a real brush, you have an outbreak, you can get it on the instrument that evening. Uh, the sequencer would run for about 48 hours. So that would take you about Monday and then say on Thursday, you can get the bioinformatics done using whole genome MLC, not necessarily the SNP analysis, because that's a lot more involved, a lot more specialized tools. But if you're using whole genome MLST and the schemes are available for that organism, you can have an answer by Thursday afternoon. I think uh, PFGE, they could have an answer by you know, Wednesday. So I think the PFGE beats it by about a day right now. But given 
the amount of information that you can get from whole genome sequencing if you have the correct whole genome MLST schemes to categorize that organism and look for those, you know, the, the virulence, the serotype, the antibiotic resistance. Um, I, I think it makes, it's, it's gonna make a little more sense to do the um, whole genome sequencing. And that's also the 48 hours for the instrument time. You know, that's if you're gonna do forward and reverse reads um, at 250 nucleotides. If you find out that you can get away with, say, only a single read, not a paired end read, where you're seeking both, sequencing both ends of a molecule, um, you could easily cut a day out of that analysis. So, uh, you know, that's one area that I'm interested in is trying to see, well, if you've got good reference genomes or a good um, whole genome MLST scheme, can you get the same actionable data by you know, shorten, shortening your runtime from 48 hours to say 16 to 24 hours. Um, and I'm sure there's, there's people working on that already. Okay. So we got 12 questions, Joel. So we're going to try to plow through some of those as okay. quickly as possible, probably. Um, one of them was how do you, when sequencing, how do you distinguish between mobile elements and integral genes or so chromosomal genes? Uh, yeah, that's going to, with whole genome MLST, that's, that's not the easiest thing to do. Um, and, and that's an area, let me think how. It's basically bioinformatics, yeah, right? It's, it's, it's going to require more bioinformatics analysis, and, it, and it's kind of a topic longer than I can answer right now. So um, it's, it's a combination of bioinformatics and relying on the biology. I think for some mobile elements like plasmids, it can be fairly easy. For other mobiles, it can be very difficult. Mm -hmm. Would you agree on that? Yeah, it, it's not trivial. So, all right. Um, another one is you spoke on how WGS can be used as a public health tool in the future. To what extent will storage of this massive information be limiting and a barrier to this scenario? And, and that's a good question. And that's a concern um, for a lot of people right now, especially in state public health labs. But, you know, if you look at the workflows that we do right now, that we perform in the lab, um, say with the Listeria whole genome database with the pilot labs, um, yes, we, we will have the run locally after we do it, but very quickly we're uploading that data to NCBI, and NCBI then is storing that data. So we could delete it off our local systems um, as soon as it's on NCBI. And then when we do the analysis, say in bionumerics for whole genome MLST, um, the CDC calculation engine is actually going to retrieve the sequences from NCBI. So you're not going to worry about the data transfer over your uh, network in the public health lab, except for that initial upload to NCBI. So I'm hoping that NCBI keeps up with all the data management. Um, but for Data for organisms that really aren't a pulse net organism or nobody's really following, you know, you're going to have to, to have some local resources to store that data. Um, but with cloud computing now and, and you know, which is fairly inexpensive, um, I think there's some solutions that, you know, you could have online in, in a matter of, you know, hours rather than having to work with your state IT department and working for months on something. Okay. So, again, um, I think a lot of it is initially when you set up whole genome sequencing in your state lab, that might be a concern, and you're going to have to probably upgrade some of the infrastructure, but long-term outside entities will help you take, take mm -hmm. care of it. Um, another question was around that you mentioned these techniques will be coming to a public health lab near you soon. Two questions. Mm -hmm. Realistically, how soon do you think it will be? Mm -hmm. It says current wait times for E. coli assets can be months. And two, do you think commercial labs would ever have those capabilities, or would this solely be the work of state and health labs slash CDC? So I'm going to take a stab at the second part. So my lab, as well as a number of other commercial labs that offer services, even specifically to the food industry, are already doing whole genome sequencing. And we do get isolates from food companies that are already using these tools to track and understand these organisms in their plants. So it is commercial labs are already there, and it's already being offered. But if you want to comment on this, on that, you know, how soon will it come to a public health lab near you? Um, so at the recent uh, Rocky Mountain uh, West uh, PulseNet meeting, you know, there's a number of talks from the, the CDC on this. And, 
and it's it's unfortunately more in the months rather than weeks when it's going to come to a public health lab near you. But I know that they're diligently working on getting the whole genome MLST for Salmonella, E. coli, and Campylobacter. And based on the talks that I saw, you know, I'm hoping that once we start getting into the throes of our summer salmonella season, that maybe we could be using those tools by then. But there's there's no promise on that. You know, it does take an enormous amount of work to validate those databases. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic that I could be using a lot of those tools this summer. So okay. Um, another question, there were a few of the similar theme that you spoke a lot about this techniques application bacteriology, but do you see any applications, utility in viral outbreaks, characterization of viruses? And we also had questions about fungal pathogens. And just as a reminder, Jolie, this group is much broader than just foodborne. So mm -hmm. if you want to comment on that a little bit or... Yeah, I could comment a little. I mean, so I don't have as much experience in that area, but what I did see, which... Um, made my head spin was a uh, talk on hepatitis C, I believe it was hepatitis C, um, one of the APHL webinars back in the fall. And that phylogenetic tree that I showed for um, all those outbreaks, when you isolate viral pathogens for hepatitis out of patients, the number of sequences you get out look like that phylogenetic tree. That the viruses, um, for my limited knowledge on that, that isn't my area of expertise right now, but it looked like for some viruses that the rate of genetic change within a patient can be huge. And um, you could end up with, you know, hundreds of genomes coming out of a single patient, especially over time. So I think there is an application there. And I know from some other talks that I've seen where they're doing whole genome sequencing on viruses, they can actually, even though you, with some of the viruses, you'll have a lot of genetic variation, they can actually trace viral spread through a community using whole genome sequencing. Um, so, it, so it is a very valuable tool there. And um, I, I would expect to see more of that in the future, so. Um, I'm gonna add one comment. So the, the platforms, the technology used for whole genome sequencing can also be used to sequence not necessarily a whole genome, but three or four or five or 10 genes in what we would call a massively sort of parallel way. And so for some viruses, it is easier to do that so that we sequence multiple genes and use those to then establish epidemiological relationships. The other application, of course, is then detection of new viruses. If you can take blood samples from patients with um, symptoms and try to discover new viruses where the same technology will also play a very, very important role. Um, Joe, the other question was on fungi. Um, how big is a fungal genome? What is happening there? Um, any comments on that? So we haven't done anything, but while, while I was looking at this, um, uh, getting ready for this um, webinar, I was looking at some of the fungal genomes and, and CERV-ECI is only about 12 million bases. And I think some of the other fungal genes you know, can be in that uh, 20, 30 million, maybe more bases. So I, I think this is very applicable to fungal genomics also. Um, so I wouldn't let that inhibit anybody. I mean, I don't currently do any, any of it, but if somebody approached me and said we want to do a, a prog uh, project with um, fungus, I, I wouldn't bat an eye. I'd do it immediately. So. Okay. So I think same question. There's a lot of potential. I think some fungi actually larger and there might be some other challenges because now you have multiple copies of chromosomes potentially. So, so some of the tools are not necessarily directly applicable, particularly on the bioinformatics side, but I think we definitely will see more and more application also to fungal disease outbreaks. Mm -hmm. um, another question was whether you can have recommend a good reference on, on basics of whole genome sequence and language. And I want to can mention the modules we have, which they will cover some of those. So these are four short modules, which we'll re-email out to everyone. But if you have some other recommendations of how people can sort of get quickly to the basics. Can you repeat that question? I, I, I missed the question in there. Good references for how people can catch up on the basics of whole genome sequencing, just sort of some either book or review article or something oh, like that. I, you know, some, some of the best uh, references, which a lot of people should have access to, is um, the SharePoint sites <laughs> um, at CDC. So I think the Food Core Center of Excellence, I don't remember if they were on there, 
Um, but there's a lot of presentations on the SharePoint site from different regional meetings that'll have good data to go through those slides. Um, you know, there, there are plenty of papers now on it, but I, I find the most useful information to be even just going in and um, Google searching for whole genome sequencing primer and, you know, setting the file type as a PDF or PowerPoint. And you can get, you know, presentations like this one and, and go through and learn um, how it's done. And I, I find those very informative on, on different topics. Um, I don't have a good reference off the top of my head, um, but it, it, there's a lot of presentations that people put out on the internet now for free that you really don't even need to, you know, have been there for the narrative to see on the different slides how things are going together. And once again, like Martin said, there's going to be additional um, uh, webinars in this series, you know, for APHL, there's going to be a bioinformatics primer course um, that, I'll, that I'll be involved in teaching also that'll get more into the details of how the algorithms work and what's really going on. So I think you're going to see a lot of other uh, educational opportunities here. And, and I also believe uh, Sarah Buss up in Wyoming has a number of webinars that are available right now on whole genome sequencing and phylogenetics uh, that you can access through the uh, ELC training program. Okay. Thank you. So what we'll do is we'll also accumulate some of those and make some of those resources available on the COE whole genome sequencing web page. And with this, we wanted to be conscious of everyone's time. Um, we're going to cut it off with regard to answering questions. We have another 13 questions here, which we will respond to you individually. Um, some of them we might forward to other people. And we're probably also trying to see how we can take some of these and convert them into frequently asked questions and, and post them on our web page. Um, feel free to contact myself or Joel or others if you have any other questions. And with that, I want to thank you for attending the webinar today. We will send out the links for the next one and we'll continuously update you as we put more information on whole genome sequencing on our web page. Thank you very much and thanks again, Joel, for doing this inaugural webinar. Thank you, Martin. It was fun.